So last week we met the human Christ. He was in the desert and he was hungry and fatigued and tempted and we saw the human nature of Jesus Christ. This week we're meeting the divine Christ. He's transfigured before the apostles. His clothes are dazzling white. He's talking with Moses and Elijah. And then the voice of the Father affirms that he's the son of the Father. You and I in our lives know that human dimension for sure. We're hungry and fatigued and tempted and lots more that goes with being a human being. But the important message of this feast is that we are also meant for the divine dimension. We are meant to be transfigured by God's light and by his love, which will shine through our frail human nature. And that is our ultimate destiny, to be transfigured. So today is really a day of incredible hope for us and for our future. We're, we're, today invites us to say, that's going to be me. I am destined to be transfigured like Jesus Christ. The Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church has done, I would say, a much better job keeping this in the forefront of their people than we have in the Western Rite. Uh, they use the word divinized. We start being divinized on the day of our baptism. We receive supernatural gifts above normal human nature. We can talk to God. We get this whole faith, hope, and charity, supernatural gifts. Our divinization starts the day of our baptism, and it's meant to go on throughout the entire course of our life. This feast, if you notice, is celebrated 40 days before Good Friday. Jesus is transfigured in glory. The reason for that is to remind us of the purpose of his transfiguration, which was to strengthen the apostles and prepare them for the upcoming scandal of Christ's death. They see his glory, there's gonna be a rocky road ahead of him before Jesus rises from the dead. St. Thomas Aquinas says that Jesus was transfigured because those walking a difficult path, that includes you and me, those walking a difficult path need a clear sense of the goal of their journey. So life isn't easy for any of us. There's ups and downs, struggles, as well as with joys. And the transfiguration means, us, oh yeah, that's where I'm going. That's my goal. Heaven is where I'm headed. I'm not meant for this world. My goal is fullness of life with God and the transformation of my body. That's the goal for every one of us. In Jesus' transfiguration, we get a glimpse, in other words, not only of his glory, but also of our own. A glory, I think, that all of us underestimate. It's good to think sometimes about the glory that's waiting us in heaven. My, my mom was great with this. She had both kinds of arthritis, osteo and rheumatoid, and a bad case of both of them. A lot of pain. And she would say, I can't wait to get to heaven and get my glorified body. That meant that she was having a rough day. That also meant that she was using her pain to increase her longing for heaven. My mom was a wise lady. She was a holy lady. She used her pain to increase her longing for pain-free, painless, glorious heaven. How are we to prepare for our life in heaven? Peter and James and John give us one way it said they went up to the mountain to pray. That's what we need to do, to step out of our everyday working world and pray. Um, when I was a young priest, uh, all the time our mantra was, my work is my prayer. As a priest, I'm doing holy things all day, baptizing, hearing confessions, taking communion to the hospital. My work is my prayer. That didn't work. And most of those guys in the 70s wound up leaving because that's not good enough. It's not enough for our work to be our prayer. We need to go beyond our normal world. Like Peter, James, and John, our mountain might be the church, a visit here to the church. Or it might be a special room in your home. Or it might be our adoration chapel. Or your car. Or a corner in your backyard. But all of us need a mountain. All of us need a place where we can unplug to meet our Lord. Besides that daily prayer, 
One of the best ways for us to prepare for heaven is it's called acting against our normal tendency, just denying it. In some ways, that's what Lent's all about, just offering that sacrifice up to God, acting against. So, do you want to eat? Fast. Skip a meal. You want a second cup of coffee? Pass it up. You want to talk about a neighbor? Switch the conversation to another topic. You want to complain? Remain silent. In other words, um, act against our normal human tendency and offer that sacrifice up to God. One of my favorite stories, maybe you heard about it, was told by St. Teresa Lusso in her wonderful book, Story of the Soul. She was in a convent, and uh, they were washing uh, dirty handkerchiefs, and they were scrubbing them in wash tubs. And there was a sister right across the wash tub from her, and she was washing with vigor. And this dirty handkerchief water was splattering on, on Sister Teresa's face. She thought, you know what, I could tell her to cut it out. She'd be very embarrassed. But I think I'll just be quiet. I don't think I could do that, right? <laughs> Dirty handkerchief water on my face. Um, but she, what was she doing? She was acting against a perfectly normal, perfectly okay tendency and just offering that up to God, that little, that little sacrifice. So maybe to sum it up, love requires sacrifice. Let me repeat that. Love requires Sacrifice, love of God, love of spouse, love of family, love of neighbor, love of enemy. Love requires sacrifice. When we embrace our crosses, we're gradually growing into our glorified body. All we have to do is be faithful to God and he's gonna take care of the glorifying part. He's gonna take care of transfiguring us. One of my favorite authors, authors C.S. Lewis, has a wonderful novel about this called Till We Have Faces, maybe you've read it. It's about a queen, a wonderful queen. She loved her people, she was good, she was kind, but her face was hideous, it was deformed. So she had a mask made and she always wore the mask throughout her whole life. Meanwhile, she was loving, kind, good to her people. It's near her time for her death and she's down at the little lake behind the castle and she takes off her face and her face is beautiful. It's beautiful. All that goodness, all that love and kindness of her life has transfigured her. I got a real life story for you. Our neighbor Mabel, she lived in the farm next to ours about a quarter mile down the road. She was like our third cousin or something. We were related somehow. Um, she and her brother stayed home to care for their widowed mom. They never married. That wasn't that uncommon back then. Quite a few people did that. Um, her mom was not a happy camper. I don't remember Aunt Isabel as ever being happy. Her brother hardly ever said anything. He would just kind of grunt. He was, he, he was <laughs> the soul of quiet. No, no emotional response whatsoever. She never complained. I would say she was homely, but beautiful. Um, I never remember her having a pity party for herself or for her lot in life. She laughed easily. She laughed a lot. She was a great cook. She would bake these huge uh, dinner rolls every Tuesday. And my brother Mike and I would just accidentally walk down the quarter mile on Tuesday and, oh, Mabel made rolls, you know. And Art would be at the table, he'd go, ugh, like that, because we're eating his rolls, you know. Uh, but she, she was just full of life, full of love. Um, had a huge garden, she was a hard worker, very simple taste, she prayed a lot. Her prayer, her, God and prayer were just like a natural part of her life. Um, I visited her a few days before her death. I did not know that was the case, but it was. Um, she had cancer, she was ambulatory, uh, walking around. She was still herself, joyful, pleasant. She had clear, eager eyes. I would say, Mabel always had clear, eager eyes. Uh, she said, uh, Father Dan, I'll be dying soon, and I'm ready, and I'll be praying for you from heaven. And I'm sure she is. Mabel was transfigured. By earthly standards, she was not beautiful, but she's one of the most beautiful people that I've ever known. Love requires sacrifice.
When we do that, our beauty comes from God. He transfigures us so we'll be ready for heaven.